Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 17th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show regularly broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, During the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our thoughts on Governor Dunleavy's Alaska revenue forecast and the leftover Walker budget proposal. Second, our view on what the new Dunleavy administration should do about the Alaska LNG project. And third, what the 2017 federal tax cut, 2018 spending bill, and the resulting huge federal deficit mean for the U.S. economy in the coming year. And then at the end, because this is our last segment of 2018, Michael asks for our final thoughts on 2018 and what we face in the new year. And now, let's join Michael. Brad is uh, with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Every week he comes in to give us his top three items that he thinks affects the state of Alaska more than anything, uh, what we need to be paying attention to. And, of course, this week it is the the budget edition because, as I said earlier, for the next two weeks we'll be off. or you know, Brad and, and Chris will not be here for the next two Tuesdays because of Christmas and New Year's. So this is our chance to really crack into the budget for the first time since it was released last week. And that, of course, is going to be uh, Brad's uh, number one of the weekly top three, the revenue forecast and the budget so far. Well, I I know there are some people who have complained that the that the budget wasn't complete, that it wasn't, you know, Governor Dunleavy's budget. It was sort of a transition budget or it was it was he picked up the the draft that Governor Walker had used and sort of used that as the template. Frankly, I find that a good thing because what it really did, the way that Governor Dunleavy presented it, is it really showed the fiscal, uh, the deep fiscal problem that we have. Uh, The net net result, the way he presented it, is a $1.6 billion deficit out of roughly a $4.5, $4.6 billion uh, budget and shows how deep the hole is uh, that that the state's facing. That's something that, frankly, because of the way that that Walker did treated the permanent fund uh, draws, uh, and the way he treated the permanent fund dividend and assumptions he made on oil prices, something that that frankly has been glossed over a lot uh, a lot by the by the last few years, and and this budget by Governor Dunleavy, the the initial budget, really I think uh, uh, displays. Uh, in 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 stark terms, how deep a fiscal hole uh, we're in, and how deep a fiscal hole he's presented. So I sort of like it in the sense that until he comes out with his amendments, what we're going to be talking about is a 1.6 billion dollar deficit, and talking about ways to to deal with that. Right, and and as we said earlier, part of this has to be an accounting change. I was just talking about Suzanne Downing's, um, you know, uh, assertion that. Um, that this is that this is Dunleavy's way of trying to put it back in when she's talking about not putting the full paybacks back in the operating budget. But again, that'll be my that'll be my my uh, my signal that Dunleavy is serious when he moves not only the paybacks, the PFD past PFD paybacks, but the current uh, formulation for the PFD out of the operating budget where Walker moved it uh, in that first year. And starts talking about that. So, I mean, he's going to put his stamp on it. I think this gives people a good snapshot of of the true budget and problems that Governor Walker has left behind. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The the revenue side, so, so the same issue that you're talking about showing up on the budget side shows up in the revenue sources book. It 
it it takes this leap between 2018 and 2019 and suddenly shows a hell of a lot more revenue uh, in the non-oil related uh, category and shows you know, available revenue at a lot higher level. What's going on there? What's driving that is 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 not as much Governor Walker's uh, approach, although that's part of it, but it's SB 26. So we now have a statute that says, with SB 26, we have a statute that says there will be a statutory draw on the permanent fund uh, from money out of the permanent fund earnings reserve that will go into the general fund and be classified as unrestricted general fund uh, uh, dollars. So what we're seeing in, in, in those numbers, what we're seeing in that movement is the effect of that statute. It's not as much um, the, the philosophy uh, that we're seeing reflected. Uh, we, we did see that the previous three years when Governor Walker did it in his budget, but, but right now we're seeing it as a result of SB 26. One of the things that, that we're gonna have to crack open and, and readdress this year in my view uh, is SB 26 and, and, and how, it's, how it's setting up draws from, uh, from the permanent fund. Uh, but, but right now it's on the, it's on the books um, and that's, that's why that number is showing up the way it is uh, in both the revenue sources book as well as is in the budget. And this has historically been a problem, and I think you and I have talked about in the past with Governor Walker, is that his revenue forecasts have been um, very, very uh, um, optimistic. Let's put it that way. Uh, I mean, some of these things ridiculously optimistic, like he sent a memo out to the Department of Revenue who said, hey, up those numbers. I really need it to look good right now because we've seen some numbers that were just uh, you know, off the chart and and completely out of character, in my opinion, with kind of where the rest of the world is saying oil is going. And I don't know what they were looking at, but even Ed King has said, you know, DOR and their production and their pricing models for the coming revenues have been wrong well over 50 percent of the time. And I think it's just gotten worse. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's bound. I mean, all prices have bounced around, right? Sure. I mean, today, yeah. today we're under we're under sixty dollars uh, uh, Brent. And we're under fifty dollars. We're in the forties again on WTI, West Texas Intermediate. So I mean, all prices have bounced around a lot. There a couple of years ago, when when Commissioner Hoffbeck was still at the Department of Revenue, um, it looked to me a lot like they had had lowballed uh, the oil prices in order to increase the amount of the deficit and increase the pressure uh, on the legislature, increase the arguing power with the legislature about the need to cut the PFD or, or implement taxes. So I, yes, I, I agree that the revenue number has been used as a political football, uh, and has been subject to some spin, uh, right. at times. Now it looks too high. I mean, the one that Walker used is it looks too high, uh, because it's in the seventies. But we have to keep in mind, in all fairness, we have to keep in mind that this most recent price drop has occurred since October, which is when they when they come up with the forecast. So we, we need to – I have a lot more confidence with Ed King now in the Department of Revenue that we're going to see um, a, a very forthright number as opposed to a politically spun number, um, and we're going to have to deal with it. I mean, right now we're going back into a, a lower oil price environment, and we're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. A lot of the reporting on the budget has said, well, the governor has – I mean, this is really – like it's shocked that this is just not really uh, Governor Dunleavy's own personalized custom budget, although pretty much anybody who's been following this understands that that was never going to happen. It was going to be a template for that for the first year that any governor steps in. It essentially is just kind of a placeholder. In fact, one year, I think it was Walker just basically said, you know, insert placeholder here. I mean, it was kind of like just a one sheet yeah. that said budget to come. Uh, here's the number that we're looking at budget to come. No details. So uh, what uh, what's your take on this and what's your take on the fact that the larger PFD payback, which he campaigned on, uh, was not included in these discussions? Well, a couple of things. One, I, I think there was a lot of hype. Uh, that that somehow with with Dunleavy coming in that they were going to have a budget prepared or that or that the new OMB director was going to be able to you know slice and dice fairly quickly and come in with with new numbers. I, I got into 
a fairly short but a fairly intense debate with somebody on social media about absolutely Governor Dunleavy is going to come in with his new budget and we're going to see it from the beginning. And, I, and my response was, no, it never really happens. You don't have enough time. Oh, no, Dunleavy is going to be different. And, and so I think there was a lot of a lot of hyped expectation about that. Uh, that that was just wrong, and and so when you have the hype, uh, and then and then you have the reality, people sort of you know react to to the difference with with some frustration. Um, in terms of the in terms of the pay the PFD payback, uh, I I agree with their approach of not including it in the budget. It would distort numbers in all sorts of different ways. If all of a sudden you threw all that additional what you would need to pay back. The PFD, if you threw that additional revenue into the into the operating budget and said, "Oh, we're going to use that to pay back the past PFD," all of a sudden the revenue number goes through the ceiling because you've got all that revenue you put in there for the PFD payback. And I can see legislators going, "Well, we got all this revenue; we shouldn't use it on all this, but we got all this revenue, and so you know we don't have to we don't have to make the cuts that uh, that we think we have to make or that right. some people are saying we have to make because we got all this additional revenue." Right. And 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 keeping those two issues distinct, separate, uh, in 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 separate, uh, going down separate tracks, I think is the right thing to do because I, the distorting effect of throwing all that additional revenue that you would need to fund the paybacks uh, into the regular budget process, I think would be, uh, I, I think it would muck things up, and 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 lead to a much less clear focus on the. $1.6 billion deficit that we've got on the operating side. So general feeling on the budget uh, plan as it's been laid out, um, positive, and uh, you look forward to seeing more after the Christmas break, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Uh, positive uh, in the sense that there's a recognition that we've got a $1.6 billion deficit. I, I think that's a highly positive I mean, it's a bad thing, but it, it's, it's highly positive in the sense that we've got that recognition out there. Um, and I think uh, I think the fact that that they are focusing, they have highlighted that they are focusing on that 1.6 billion. I think they're going in the right direction. That's a huge amount of work ahead uh, to deal with that. Uh, but but I think it's positive that we've highlighted that. Uh, you just mentioned the uh, the new Brent and WTI pricing. Uh, I see that you posted this morning um, a comment that has since been shared by several people and uh, lamented by several people that it looks like oil is now seeking a new bottom. What does this mean for the budgets uh, moving forward for the governor's, even his temporarily proposed budget? What, what, I mean, what are we looking at here? Well, Michael, in, in, in all honesty, we're looking at one of two things. We're either looking at brutal, either at brutal cuts. And I mean, brutal cuts, cuts that I think can be made cuts that you and I have discussed on this show, uh, but brutal. For example, we're looking at uh, you know, one of the one of the cuts that I think is realistic is having cutting in half uh, the budget for the uh, the University of Alaska system. If you look at uh, what their peer what our peer groups spent or spend other peer institutions in other states spend per student full time equivalent student, uh, Alaska spends roughly double uh, in state in state funds roughly double what is spent uh, at our peer institutions. But, and so I, I think there's a, a, a very strong case for cutting uh, the university funding uh, in half. Now, I think that should go along with cutting, with, with, with closing two of the institutions and, and frankly concentrating on one very good university as opposed to three sort of mediocre universities. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's the kind of, to get a $1.6 billion deficit closed, uh, and maybe a, a $1.6 billion deficit that's going to grow if oil prices do, in fact, stay down again for a, a, an extended period. Uh, we're, we're looking at brutal cuts. If we don't make those brutal cuts, uh, um, I think we're looking at we're going to have to look at revenues. Um, it, and we can't look we can't look at savings and fiscal reserves anymore. We run through them all. Uh, in the last seven years, in the last seven years, we've drawn down roughly $20 billion dollars. Uh, roughly a third of the budget has been financed over that seven year period has been financed by pulling money out of the fiscal reserves. They're drained. So now we're talking about either cutting the PFD uh, directly by, you know, just taking money that otherwise goes to the PFD and move it into the uh, uh, move it into the general fund 
or indirectly by starting to drain the permanent fund earnings reserve and using that as yet another fiscal reserve, or we're talking about other taxes. So it, it, it's, it's a very stark reality uh, that I think these oil prices are, are bringing us back to, um, and one that, that we put off uh, dealing with for the last seven years, the last three years of the Parnell administration, the four years of the Walker administration, we tried this trick or that trick or, or this reserve fund or that reserve fund to sort of cover up uh, what was going on to us. All that's gone now, and now we're going to face the stark reality of, of either making these spending cuts or facing up that we need uh, that we're going to have to raise uh, new revenue through uh, uh, through some other means. Yeah, and I mean, I look at these numbers, and again, the danger here uh, that that I've talked about in the past, and I know you have as well, of uh, having an economy based on a sole single volatile commodity. I mean, we really need to start talking about how do we diversify the revenue stream of the state of Alaska? Uh, I mean, whether that is expanding the income from other resources, whether we talk more about timber, whether we talk about changing the severance taxes on, for example, the net severance that they've got on minerals, gold, for example, and some of these other things right now. Or, you know, we just look to other things. It's it's very difficult when the entire state is, uh, uh, you know, is depending on one very volatile item uh, being oil and the fact that we've got world players like, you know, Russia and OPEC right now duking it out, you know, glutting the market, causing a lot of these supply, uh, you know, overages and these surplus overages and, and driving the prices around. We have no control of any of that. We need to be looking at different ways to fund the state to, you know, keep us going and live within our means both. Yeah, and Hammond. I mean, you and I, I think since the outset of of, the, of these programs we've done together, we've talked about Hammond fifty fifty and the ability to bring in. I mean, the vision of Governor ha Governor Hammond to have the other half of the earnings uh, uh, to help support government, and that using that uh, would bring in a hugely diverse revenue stream. Right? It's a revenue stream that's predicated on a wide variety of investments uh, in the market and earnings off investments in the market. So that would help that would help temper uh, the volatility we've got on the oil side. What what we've what we've wasted in all honesty is by relying on these fiscal reserves and sort of putting off judgment day and hoping oil prices would recover. Uh, what we've wasted is four years uh, that we could have been making gradual reductions in government, relying on the fiscal reserves to sort of see us through, bridge us through gradual reductions in government and get our, our spending structure down to a level that, that it could survive these sorts of, uh, these sorts of, of, of the sort of volatility uh, on the oil side. I mean, that's what the oil companies did for the last four years, right? I suppose I could go in and see uh, Harold uh, has got some things to say, of course. Uh, take uh, If a PFD was so important, it would take 10 minutes to take it out of the budget. The only law is the current PFD. Unless there's an announcement to reform the formulas, then the deficit will remain an issue. Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, and I, I agree with that. I mean, we have to break into the budget, into the uh, formulas. If we're going to take a look at this budget, and I know we've talked with him about that, Governor Dunleavy, I mean, uh, about that. And he said, yes, that is definitely on the table and one of the things that he would like to do. Now, the question is, will it really happen? And I think, as we talked about this earlier, as we see oil prices continue to crater down, there's really probably not going to be any choice. No, there's not going to be any choice. I, 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 somebody the other day challenged me to say, OK, so where, where are you going to find a billion six in cuts? And the answer is you cut the university in half. You eliminate all of the optional Medicaid services, which gives you another $350 million. You go down to just the, the required fundamental Medicaid services as opposed to the, all the optional services uh, we've broken into. You cut out inflation. You cut out the growth uh, between the 27, 2018 budget and the 2019 budget. You reverse that. You, you don't have any inflation adjustment going forward. And then you have to cut K through 12. Um, and and the and the other agencies uh, outside of the university have to cut them by 10 percent. So yeah, you've got to go into you have got to go into uh, the formula programs. You've got to go into Medicaid, which is a formula program, and you've got to go into K through 12, which is a formula program to 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 get these cuts uh, achieved. 
Let's move on here briefly to our number two, and we can just do a brief introduction before we have to go to break. Uh, what needs to happen uh, in number two with the Alaska LNG project right now? I mean, we've got a big, some big monies that are going to have to be happening. We've got the uh, the the partnership with China. Uh, we've got lots of things going on. The trade wars and the tariff things happening that is uh, affecting it as well. Uh, give us a brief intro before we go to break here. Well, Alex DeMarvin has has a very good piece uh, published a couple of days ago in the Anchorage Daily News. Uh, the headline is Dunleavy Way's Fate of $43 Billion Gas Line Plan. And it goes into some detail about what, what uh, former Governor Parnell found uh, as, uh, as, he, as he went into, the, into some of the detail. He was asked by Governor Dunleavy to look into the pipeline and then report back to Governor Dunleavy. And, and that article has some great detail on what Parnell found um, and, and the recommendations he's given Governor Dunleavy, which, uh, which may surprise some people. So um, I think it's a I think it's a that, that's a for anybody interested in the gas pipeline. That's an article that's, a, that's sort of a, an important to read uh, and gives you a, a, a direction about uh, where we may be going. Uh, Brad, we were in the middle of talking about our top uh, or two of our weekly top three the Alaska LNG and what needs to happen. As you were mentioning, DeMarban in the Alaska or Anchorage Daily News has an article about uh, this, uh, what, you know, you know, the Dunleavy, you know, kind of weighs on the fate of the $43 million gas line plan. He had appointed former Governor Sean Parnell to kind of look into this. And it's not just like, hey, here's a folder. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents and details so many uh, that uh, Parnell was actually not even able to go through everything before the transition occurred, uh, but he's still able to make a recommendation. So why don't you hit us with some highlights here? Well, I, so Governor Parnell, Parnell did go through, did have detailed discussions, according to the article and what I've heard otherwise, did have detailed discussions with AGDC about where they are and, and, and their outlook and, and where they think they uh, are, are headed on these things. And Parnell's recommendation back to Governor Dunleavy, uh, according to the article, and again, according to what I've heard from others, is that we need to go ahead and complete uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the permitting process from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that, that we've gone this far um, and that uh, the project still has viability, and I, and I believe it has viability, uh, and that it would be sort of a waste to have gotten this far in, in a market where we still can play a role and not complete the uh, not complete the permit process. Now, the article says, and I hadn't heard this previously before reading the article, but the article says it's going to take an additional $40 million uh, of the state's money to go ahead and complete uh, complete the permit process on top of the somewhat some 20 some odd million dollars that's still remaining in the uh, AGDC's budget. And so what, what that's going to raise is coming into this legislative session and saying, and including as part of, of the Dunleavy budget, that we need this $40 million uh, in order to uh, complete uh, the per permitting process. That's going to bring the whole LNG uh, issue front and center in front of the legislature because particularly given the deficit we're facing, $40 million isn't chicken feed. Um, and it's going to have the effect of backing out, you know, money that 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 some are going to want to spend uh, on other things. I think that that's a good use uh, of our money uh, to complete the good use of money to complete the permitting process. But as we've talked about on the program before, I also think it's important to get reconnected with the producers um, and 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 sort of bring the band back together again the way we had it before. Uh, the um, uh, before the governor uh, took us down the track of the of a state led project, bring the band back together again with the producers, and and get back on the same page about where we're taking this project for or how we're taking this project forward. Um, and frankly, I think part of that forty million dollars, if we do that bring the band back together again, I think part of forty million dollars gets contributed uh, by uh, by the producers. I don't know how much, but I think I think some of it some of it could be. And then, and then once we have the band back together again, I think we we have a a, a a revised, a new outlook on where we're going. There is growth in the LNG market. There was an article in 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 oil, uh, one of the oil publications that I that'll be posted on the Facebook page later today. There is a huge market for LNG growth, 
and it's in the Pacific Rim. It's uh, in North uh, Northeast Asia, um, and 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 on down through the uh, through the Asian coastline in the Pacific Rim. Um, and we're Alaska is the best position, particularly with respect to Northeast Asia. Alaska geographically is the best position uh, potential supplier uh, to that market. So there is there is a a success path here uh, for the LNG project, um, and I think and I do think it's important to uh, to go ahead and complete the permitting. But I think it's equally as important to get the band back together with the producers. Uh, and and reconnect with them in terms of where this project's going and how we're gonna how we're gonna deliver this project. All right. So, <clears throat> good news in your opinion, then, uh, as uh, Governor Parnell uh, has examined this. He, according to the article, the way I read it, he's still got some more work to do, and uh, he's going to come out. But initially, his recommendation is to now wait for FERC or federal approval of the gas line project as a whole, and then it's kind of a wait and see attitude from there. Yeah, but but we got to spend money to get to that permit point. We've got to spend money to get the permit. So uh, it's it's proceed forward uh, to get that permit. I'm not sure uh, there there was nothing in the article that gave me an indication of what Parnell what Parnell's view is of where we went once we had the permit. Um, I think frankly we're, we're seeing the market, the LNG market, evolve. We're seeing you know the trade war with China evolve. Uh, we're in this period where hopefully we're negotiating the 90-day period that President Trump and and President Xi uh, worked out to negotiate a resolution of the trade war. Hopefully we have a resolution of the trade war. And frankly, Michael, if we have a resolution of the trade war, I think this project gets back on track relatively quickly. So um, we're I, I think Parnell's primary focus was don't shut it down right now. Keep it going to the to the permit stage. And I think along with that, uh, my recommendation on top of that is get the band back together again and then uh, and then hope the trade war is getting resolved. Uh, our final of our top three is uh, looking back on 2018. And uh, you are taking a look at this from kind of the federal level, but it has ramifications for Alaska. we got about uh, five minutes here, four and a half minutes. So there was an article in in The Hill. Uh, one of the publications that I follow is a, is a Capitol Hill focused uh, uh, publication uh, that's called The Hill. Um, and and it's, it's, I follow it because, frankly, a lot of people on The Hill follow it. And it has a lot of, uh, a lot of influence and, and, and is, uh, uh, is a fairly, well, it's a nonpartisan, fairly straightforward, factual-based uh, uh, based publication. There's an article in a, in a recent uh, edition just a few days ago uh, that's focused on where the economy is going, and it says expect to slow down. The headline is expect to slow down in economic growth in 2019, and sort of goes through the uh, the the writer's view uh, of uh, of where the economy is headed. The um, a key part of of the view of where the economy is headed uh, is sort of relates to what the steps that we took in fiscal policy, the federal government took in fiscal policy the last year. The two big steps were the tax cuts, uh, at the very end of 2017. And then the big spending bill that came in March, uh, of 2018 and the, and the, the assessment, um, and the writer says quickly, the author says quickly that he supported the tax cuts, but the assessment is, that they haven't achieved the objective uh, that was set out for them, and, the, and that they're not—they're not the savior for the economy. The the types of investments, business investments that people would hoped for uh, in the tax cuts haven't haven't materialized. Uh, that the repatriation of money, of foreign money, money that's held in foreign accounts by corporations back into the U.S. to be invested in the U.S. hasn't materialized, um, and that while the combination of the tax cuts. Uh, and uh, uh, and the spending bill have generated more money in the economy and it's been spent on the consumption side, uh, that really hasn't generated the type of ongoing additional economic activity that leads to the type of economic growth that uh, that that causes the tax cuts to pay for them to be to pay for themselves. So the net net result uh, is that we've increased the deficit uh, as a result of both the tax cuts, the lot the drop in revenue, and as a result of the big spending bill in March, uh, we've increased the deficit substantially, which, is have, which has a drag on the overall economy. 
uh, and has has created, along with various other things that's going on, the tariff wars um, uh, and uh, and economic downturns in other nations, uh, is 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 creating a, 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 a view for 2019 that's not very positive, uh, a, a view of, of very low uh, economic activity or, or, or troubling economic activity in 2019. And when you look at the stock market, that sort of confirms it. The stock market is a imperfect but somewhat um, useful sort of judge on where investors believe the economy is going. Uh, investors in companies that are listed on the stock market at least are going and the stock stock market has been running low uh, has been in decline uh, for the past few days in fact I saw one figure this morning that, sh that says that the stock market the, the index the indices on the stock market are now below the numbers that they were when the tax cut uh, bill was passed that we've gone backwards <laughs> uh, in ter in terms of the stock market so the, the 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 perception that we're heading into a rough patch in 2019 and possibly some people or a lot of economists are talking about a recession in 2020 uh, the perception is being reflected in current current stock prices well and all you have to do is uh, brad said earlier he gets into these uh, short brief arguments sometimes on social media all you have to do to see a lot of partisanship in action is to see Brad post about how the tax cuts are not helping us in a lot of ways, but hurting us because they didn't have the commensurate spending cuts that were required to really make them work. And you could see an immediate ballooning of animosity uh, coming out, uh, of course, about how Brad must be a communist uh, Democrat <laughs> by uh, by pointing this out. And, of course, the tax cuts have done wonderful. And, uh, you know, it's simple economics, but sometimes people just they get so caught up in their partisanship. It's it's just amazing. Any final thoughts here? As we we've had our weekly top three, and we got a couple minutes here before we run out of daylight. I think I think the the thing that that's useful to leave uh, with people at the end of 2018, the last program in 2018, looking into 2019, is 2019 is going to be one tough year. It's going to be tough from the state standpoint in terms of the cuts we have to make or the decisions we're going to have to make uh, on revenue. Uh, in order to deal with, uh, if we can't make those cuts, in order to deal with keeping the budget uh, uh, in balance. Uh, and it's going to be one tough year on the, at the federal level. The, the economic growth that everybody, I think, uh, looked forward to is, is in decline. It's not going to pan out. Uh, and and we're going we're gonna to be in for a tough year uh, at the federal level. The deficits are continuing to grow. They're continuing to get just entirely out of hand. Now we're going to cross a trillion dollars. Uh, uh, annual deficit in, in the current year. So it's going to be one tough year. People need to hunker down and, and we need to stop one thing that I think has held Alaska back as we've tried to deal with this issue over the last four years. And, it, and it's this. People say, I know the budget needs to be cut and by God, we need to make these big cuts all over the place except for my program over <laughs> here. Don't. Don't, yeah. don't cut my program over well, here. And you mentioned the university, and I can already hear the caterwauling from across the whole state as you talk about cutting the university down. Uh, 10% would be bad enough. Cutting it in half, my God, you have just created something you know horrible and horrific. There's absolutely no way. Uh, well, you, you know what? I mean, you can cut it by a third, but then you got to cut K through 12 by 15% to, right. to get the, to get the number. So it's, it's, it's going to have to come someplace. We, we have got to get to the point. I mean, once you, once everybody says, don't cut my program over here, cut everything else, but don't cut my program over here. Once you take that through 60 legislators, there's nothing left to cut because everybody's got their own little niche that they're trying to protect. So if 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 people listening to this want to want one swing thought for coming to the to to the to the new year and what we're going to face the new year it's don't let their friends get away with saying but don't cut my piece of the of the budget everybody needs to take cuts everybody needs to take deep cuts uh if we're going to get through this and if oil prices stay down where we're where we're headed it may be even deeper yet uh, but it's just going to be a tough year. We need to buck up for it. We need to be ready for it. We need to rest up over Christmas and come in it with, uh, you know, come in it with everything we got. Well, uh, I'm ready for the recharge personally. I've, uh, again, I'm, I'm about politicked out this year, but uh, we're going to have to be ready because this session is going to be messy. I mean, I can tell you already, it's going to be messy uh, with the new majority, whatever the new majority in the House ends up being. 
Uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a tough fight. It's going to be a tough year, and we're going to be facing some of the biggest challenges this state has seen in forever. Um, especially if uh, oil prices continue to crater down and and we continue to see some of these changes. But if you want to read more, check out Brad's writings at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook. Uh, some pretty interesting stuff out there. You can watch it, and uh, and we can cover that uh, here in the future. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board and joining us with us this morning. We really appreciate you being part of the program. Michael, thank you for having me, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year since we're wrapping up the program for the year. You bet. We'll see you in the new year. Appreciate that. Well, that's a wrap, not only for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, but also for 2018 as we take the next two weeks off for our holiday break. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again after the first of the year on the Weekly Top 3.